On this day, October 7th, 1763, a royal proclamation was issued by King George III. This proclamation dealt with the settlements in the Americas and limited British settlement to the watershed of the Appalachian Mountains. The proclamation came just after the Treaty of Paris which had ended the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War had been an am amazing success for the British. It had been a world war. They had been fighting in India, fighting in North America, across Europe and across the seas. There had been battles in the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean and the North Atlantic, obviously. It had been an intense war and one in which Britain had come out on top. They had finally ended French presence in North America. Quebec had been conquered, as had Montreal. French settlements around the St. Lawrence and into the Gulf of St. Lawrence were finally unequivocally British. The British colonies of North America were now secure and safe. But the good governance of all these new lands meant that the government in London needed to try to control the inevitable land rush that would begin in North America once the French were gone and once the war was over. Obviously, George III was acting upon his government's advice, but to many of the American revolutionaries, they painted George III as some sort of tyrant, which he never was. And the policy was actually a sensible one. It was sensible not just from good governance, but it was sensible also because you don't want to start unnecessary wars with the natives in North America. The British had been allied to many of these tribes who had helped fight the French with them. So you can't just throw them overboard. You've got to reward them somehow. And one reward is to allow them to keep their lands. So in many ways, it was a civilized, decent thing to do. And it also wasn't permanent. This was not limiting British settlement in North America forever. What it did was trying to prevent the grasping, greedy land speculators that were making fortunes and settling people in the middle of nowhere amongst Indians who were then annoyed that they had these people on their land. The plan was that they were going to use this proclamation to prevent all these scallywags trying to make money and that only crown officials would be licensed to buy land and negotiate land transfers. That was the point. However, if you know your history, this is one of the infamous acts that the Americans declared was oppression towards them, even though the land they held along the east coast was equivalent to about three or four Great Britons at the time. And there, at the time, maybe there was two, two and a half million people living in those colonies. So it wasn't like there wasn't land that they could settle on already. Also, another reason to stop the settlement of, land, of the land out beyond the Appalachians 
was they inherited a population of French-speaking people, about 60,000 in the St. Lawrence Valley. They were Catholic, they were French-speaking, they'd never really rebelled against Britain, and they ended up being quite you know, passive and just got on with their lives. They wanted good governance, and Britain gave it to them. But one of the things they had to do was to prevent the rowdy American colonists going into Quebec and then taking the land because again, as with the Indians, it would just cause trouble. Now, as I said, it wasn't supposed to be permanent. And it, there were actually negotiations with the Iroquois and with other tribes around what is now Tennessee and Kentucky where this line was extended. So even before the American Revolution, the proclamation line had already been changed, possibly because of events on the ground just meant that you had to accept reality, especially in what is now Kentucky and Tennessee. There was a lot of settlement going on illegally because people on the frontier were ignoring the proclamation, ignoring the new laws and regulations. And so the line was extended, negotiations were had with the locals, and it was going as it was supposed to. Now, if there hadn't been an American Revolution, I don't think the proclamation line would be all that big a deal in history. By now, it'd be long gone, it'd be one little thing a detail of history that no one would remember. Maybe except some nerds. But it became a part of the propaganda of the American revolutionaries. They made such a big deal out of it and said it is oppression. <laughs> the British government, this foreign government that was our government five minutes ago, is oppressing us by not allowing us to go over there and take that land. Now, some of the people in charge, people like Washington and others, actually had interests in the Ohio Valley, and so they may have been financially incentivized to go along with the propaganda and even go along with the revolution. Because if you get them, the government, out of the picture, hmm, all that land is suddenly open to settlement and you can sell it. Make a lot of money that way. So, kind of sounds a little bit suspicious to me. What is incredible is that after the American Revolution and they went through everything and Britain ceded them all of that territory that was east of the Mississippi and south of the Great Lakes. The new American government introduced laws very much like the proclamation that the king issued decades before. And the reason they did it was because of the very same reasons because otherwise they would have non-stop war on the frontier. There needed to be a legal, peaceful way to transfer land, to buy land, to acquire land, and you couldn't just allow people to go in and take it. And so after all of the trouble, all of the recriminations, all of the allegations of oppression, they turned around and did the very same thing, which is a bit strange. A bit hypocritical, you could say. Now, many years after this proclamation, it has become recognized as part of Canadian law. In 1982, the Canadian Constitution was promulgated. Funny how it looked, took Canada that long. They had to go 
to the British Parliament and asked them to pass an act of Parliament to allow them to have their own constitution. But it became a part of that constitution, recognizing the legal rights of what they call First Nations. And so now, the Brit's proclamation by King George III is being used now in courts and in litigation by First Nations peoples, using that line as an admission that everything beyond it was originally theirs. So, it may just be one little proclamation from many years ago that was only meant to paper over a temporary problem, but it became infamous, and it became part of law, and it became a part of a constitution, and it is being referred to even now, appealed to even now. I wonder if the people who wrote this believe that we would be talking about it 250 years later. Probably not. Okay, so on this day, October 7th, 1763, the Royal Proclamation Line was established. Come back tomorrow, subscribe if you like these videos, like and make a comment. Thank you.